These are going to be all of the hacks and tricks and tips and the things that we've learned over that experience uh, that we wanted to share with you and things that we think are the most important. So we've curated a bit of a list here. I, I don't think a black or white undercoat makes much difference anymore. Well, would your red actually be just as vibrant if you put it over black? Yes or no? And then would that save you time down the line when it goes to base coat and your gold because your gold actually covers better over black? It's just another example of how there's no set correct way to approach it. If you've been painting a bit like a butterfly from de and focusing on details and painting details, Flipping to this method of painting at first is a lot more arduous. Did you all see the uh, the Warhammer Day reveals? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I was out for for lunch with my parents. They took took me and Ree out for lunch, and uh, and my phone was buzzing like uh, a bee's nest. Literally, I, I was just. He's done it. He's already done it. What? He's done it. Sure, Are you start, thinking of these? I should no, start a stopwatch. I should start a stopwatch for every episode. <laughs> just times to yeah. Jamesism. Genuinely, I, that was just. We'll start putting in the chapters on YouTube, like the time timestamp every single James is. <laughs> yeah. Anything uh, tickle you fancy? Anything standing out to you? Well, the thing is, I didn't get to sit all because I was out for lunch, as I said. Like, so, like, you still not seen it now? Yeah, no, I have now. But like, uh, I, at the time when it was obviously going, my phone was going nuts, and those people were talking about it. I had obviously a couple of groups that I'm in, and other people were talking about it. So it was, um, it was quite funny to actually then just like. Uh, finished having lunch my parents stayed over for a bit and then at the end when they're gone I then just obviously checked all the new stuff that come out they didn't um, fancy watching the stream right? no it's not, not my dad's usual Saturday viewing so you know when there's always that guy at like the Sunday roast who's got the football on on their phone yeah, yeah. you should yeah. have been like that no, but with I the stream for Warhammer I, do I travelled a long way I couldn't do that so yeah so it'd be disrespectful I'm like both of those people I should have two phones I have my Warhammer on one on the other you've got like multi-cam going yeah. <laughs> yeah no um yeah, but I thought it was good. Lots of really cool things. Uh, th well, where to start, really? I think for me, I think the 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 new uh, the Necron. I can't remember the character's name now. Uh, Imatech Storm Imatech was really really cool. It's nice that it pays homage to the original model quite a lot, which I think is good. I think is that the fine cast one that's going out. It is. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's finally been replaced, which is great. Um, it, it, so so yeah, it, like it's good that it nods really hard to that one, which I think is good. I think. Um, you know, if something's not broken, don't fix it. I think just, uh, you know, just, just nodding to that original model and a lot of the vibe and, and pose. Um, they could have gone a bit crazy and done something a bit different, but I think um, I think some certain models do need quite a lot of lean to the original one, if that makes sense. I think um, when you look at Necrons as like a range of models as well, they've had quite a few characters that are like new, bigger, yeah. new, a bit more crazy King. models. Yeah, like, um, like crazier models, so like having just a fairly standard redo, I think it's probably needed because there's only so much. Like, the, if I was if I was doing the Necrod army and every character that come out was like <laughs> like massive and all this extra stuff on it, I'd probably a bit be a bit uh, fuming. But I think yeah, it's got it's a bit more. It maybe looks a little bit um, like. It has less of an impact than, say, when you see Seraphs for the first time. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. What was the one with, like, uh, one that had, like, loads of little pistols? The oh, Necron, uh, the Necron. I can't remember what it's called. Remember what now, it's called but I know but like ones mean. like that, they're a bit beefier, a bit bigger. But, yeah. Um, yeah, still cool, I think. Admech, on the other hand, they, they've been doing a lot of experimenting by the looks of it. Uh, yeah, that is... Uh, definitely missed that, the leg day. That was a talking point, that one. Yeah. Um, uh, it's really cool. I, like I think the good thing it looks like a Skitari Ranger, but then they've they've got like if imagine going through a swamp and they they just need like leg extensions to yeah. go through it or to look over a building or something. It looks um, like um, you know when you're at like a carnival and like you you accidentally like catch the guy like putting the costume on. <laughs> <laughs> So he hasn't put his coat on yet. He hasn't put his like long trench coat to cover up his like. Yeah, his it's sticks. like someone's. You've just caught someone at Covent Garden just packing down, and they're just <laughs> finishing their show for the day. Yeah, getting yeah. off of there, and you're like, oh, that's how he was floating. He's on a little. It goes through the cloak. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's, um, it's really cool. Like it's it's totally different uh, as 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 a as a vibe and as a model. I quite uh, dig it actually. It's fun, isn't it? I do like it. Yeah, a lot. I, I, I'm never gonna knock something for being like. A little bit different. Well, you know no. what I mean? It's cool to have something different. The thing is, it's quite hard. Like like with Necrons, like as a range, like Admech, you know it's going to be mechanical, obviously. Um, it's so going to be a robot man with a red cloth. Exactly, on yeah. yeah you know, There's only so, so many so, of them you can do before you start putting stilts on them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's quite interesting because it's like, you know, the, 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 what are the Dragoons, the Walkers? It's like, it's like the, 
the guys the guys gone down to the to the sort of like the the, the carpool or the garage in the in the admec base or whatever and it's like he's like see i could just get him i could get him one of those today or i could just have longer legs <laughs> like you know um so so yeah it's, it's really cool just a quick one. We wanted to remind you that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Siege Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget. Whether you're on a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army, we offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at siegestudios.co.uk. And just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% off of your first commission using the code PAINT5. Back to the show. This is probably my favorite one. The Lord Relictor. What a model. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, crazy model. It's just so cool. It's like the. It's just one of those models where you see and you go, "Oh yeah, this is what." It's ticking a lot of boxes, isn't it? It's dragon, <laughs> dead dead man, <laughs> armor, cool base. I mean, that's, that's what I look that's for. A pretty, it's like, like a wish list my, model, isn't have it? You, but you've seen my notes because that's what my tick list. Whenever I look at a model, <laughs> dragon, dead man. <laughs> What else was it? Cool uh, base. Armor. Cool base. Uh, armor, cool base. Yeah. They're the four things I look for. So, Oh, and stilts. Yeah. He's, he's, not, not, he's not got stilts. stilts. He's not got no. stilts. Well, he's kind of got a... You, you, could think of the, uh, you could think of the rock on the base. As it's a, a giant stilt. stilt. Yeah. yeah. It's such a cool model. I can't wait to see it in person. Yeah. Um, I do like the, the, the Stormcast, like, dragon stuff. Yeah, like yeah the a lot of it is really cool. Have well. you ever seen any of them in person? Because like, yeah, yeah, we've I've, had a few yeah. through. The, I've the, never yeah. really gauged how big that. Because looking at it, I bet that's one of those models that isn't as gargantuan as you. It's probably think. not as big as you think it is. Looking at that, mm. model. what's it on? Like yeah. an 80, 80 mil base? Maybe oh, I don't think yeah. they say, but it's probably like an eighty or a sixty. I do wish they would say that would help so much. I mean, they say when it goes up on a on the, on the store, yeah, 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 but just ahead of time. But, paint, um, paint job's great as well. I love the high contrast to the armor to the dragon uh, and the been desaturated base. You can because it's got a, like an infantry or like a character size model on top of it. You can kind of gauge the, the, scale. the scale. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They done like a Lord Relic the, um ages ago in one of their Mortal Realms like magazine. Mm. It's like the same. I'm sure. Is, same character. Isn't, character isn't sort he of thing. Just, he's a model that's available individually as a, cl- a clan pack, isn't he? I'm sure. I, I, I have to. I have to not, admit, that, not that one. Not that specific one, but another Lord Relictor. Um, Oh, I'm sure they did. I've heard of Stormcast stuff, but I'm pretty yeah, sure I'm, Lord Relictor, we have some trouble sometimes when people are asking for it in quotes and things because there was a there was at least some time where that was the only way to get it, I think, mm. was through that magazine and like you couldn't necessarily find it all the time. I'm sure there is one available in a clamp pack now, but if, sure. I, if I'm wrong, then just chuck it in the comments. But I'm... I'm yeah, I, I think you can. There are so... like They're like Marines where they've got so many characters, obviously, in the HQ section. You mean a clamp pack? Well, um... Just a single character pack. He means a blister pack. Blister pack. Oh yeah, but I suppose they're not. They're not blisters anymore. You why, say blister pack. That's why I call it. That's why I call it a clam, yeah, yeah. clam pack. That's what it is. It's like a clam, it's a clam shell. It's, it's a clam, clam shell. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Clam pack. All right. You've, got, you've, got, a box all right of you've got a different name. No, it's to not me. a clam right. shell either. That's that's um that's like VHS cover cases. Clam shells. You know, like the plastic VHS case. This is anyway, great the conversation new, for a new, I'm just saying, that's not what that <laughs> anyway, is the new, so, the, the, the Silver Knife character. Yeah, uh, Bell Thanos. Yeah. I've no idea. So oh, I absolutely love this. I've got to say that... This is, this is like the 40k implementation of A Bug's Life. So mm-hmm. I saw the bug and I know exactly what it reminds me of. Um, in Godzilla, the Godzilla film, you know the bugs that come out of the ground, the ones that, awake, that reawaken? No, because I haven't what, seen Godzilla. What Godzilla film? Newer, one of the newer films. I didn't see the newer one. Well, the one with Brian Cranston in it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're saying yeah. actors' names and I'm not sure who it is. But... Millie Bobby Brown's in it, I think. Well. Really? Yeah, pretty sure. What there's, a go- there's, a, there's a new Godzilla film. Someone who's watching this will get it in the comments, but there is a, in one of the new Godzilla films... I the, James the, doesn't know Brian Cranston is. You were. You were I probably know his face, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that like is, you'd still think, yeah. You'd yeah. Remember, my film film background stops like just after like the, the two thousand. Yeah, Brian Cranston was, was yeah. probably just leaving college or something when James. <laughs> that's yeah. the last film that James <laughs> likes to watch. <laughs> well, I have watched New Godzilla films. So that's <laughs> yeah. why I know. That's why I know. But the bug in a weird segue looks obviously it's not as bright as that in the film. It's like more of a grayish kind of color. But in the Godzilla films, there's the 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 male giant bug. It, it looks a lot. That looks it's very very familiar. It looks very similar in my mind, just just from the haunch kind of status with the rear with the elevated rear bit. Um, I just like that it. Um, I don't know the silver neck range like extremely well, same. but I like that it nods. To, it ties in with Lara's beetle thing. 
Well, yeah, quite but it, I mean, that's way brighter. I mean, like obviously the Beatles black and the Lara. I just mean in terms of the design. Yeah, but that's just the colour, isn't design. it? I mean, yeah, yeah, I yeah. Yeah. No, but it's like a flip. So like, where, whereas the bug is dark on a Lara and she's the bright thing, the rider is yeah, a bit it's like more the desaturated and the bug but is But I just went more in the design cues of it. I like that it's kind of tying into that. So that just Especially with the legs. and My yeah, only experience yeah. with it is obviously like what we get through and whenever we've done Silver Nef stuff, I can't really remember seeing anything that had that kind of no. creature other than a Lario. So I'm sure there is other stuff out there. Yeah. And this one's got the Horn of Gondor, so... Well, there you go. I don't think it's the actual Horn of Gondor there, George. I think it's a, a spoof variant. <laughs> but, but, I didn't even see he was doing that. I was yeah, busy yeah. looking at the... It is. The, yeah. That, yeah. Mo- that model is, is phenomenal. Like, I say this all the time, as much as I love 40K, uh, I, uh, like, Age of Sigma models are... The design on them is just incredible. Like, the design team and, and have, have smashed it with it. They look so good. The real win of uh, the whole reveals, in my humble opinion, is, of course, the new Striking Scorpions. Yeah. I like them a lot. That's a reserved response, isn't it? <laughs> I like them a lot. I've been waiting for uh, Striking Scorpions for quite some time, uh, and it's good to see more, more aspect warriors in plastic. I wish that there was a few more sort of like fast-moving poses. It's like a kill posing. team, though. No, I know that, but like Scorpions are a combat combat unit, and I just like like with like Assault Incessors and like a lot of, like if you think of the Howling Banshees, for example, Howling Banshees are the other close combat aspect they're all moving very quickly. They look like they're charging. They look like they're in These combat. These are though like way more dynamic than the new Guardians. I'm not disputing that at all. Like they're, look, I, I don't want to, you've got to take what I'm saying with a pinch of salt. Like I absolutely love them. I think they're phenomenal. I think they're, the design, redesign of them looks great. I think everything, I, I just think for a combat unit personally, you want to see them running or charging or or doing something that looks a bit more, Elder are known for being athletic, known for being like, you know, like fast, if that makes sense. So like, I just would like to see some a mix of leg poses, basically. I wonder what the like actual box when they come out eventually will be. You like. might have options, like you never yeah. know. Like I'm, I'm again. Bear in mind that we're commenting on all these things based on solely the images that we've seen, and we've said it hundreds of times before. Like you see a two D version of a model in a, in a in a in a in a marketing shot or in a photo or whatever, or mm. you know, and then you see it in the flesh, and it's like totally, totally different. Yeah, you um, see a two D version of it. You talk about it on a podcast. Darren Latham comments on it and proves you wrong, <laughs> and then you get it and you love it anyway. It's a classic cycle. The cape, the cape, it's a classic the, cycle. The cape is still out of the way of the yours. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I just love how like crisp they are. Like it's exactly what I loved about the the guardians, the new refresh. guardians, yeah, the, and the, the the heavy metal paint job on these is like absolutely. Stellar. They, they smashed it. Yeah. I really like the, the bit bit of a mixed bag we had in response to should they be helmeted or not but I really like the <laughs> the faces that they've got on these about the helmets like they look they look great they look, super like, they look great great bare head like half it. helmeted half not I'm sure do you actually get full face masks in, in, the, in any of the shots that they've put out because I, I, I can't remember if you do do you get full do you get full uh, full face masks on them at all um, as in full, full, full helmets well you've got you've got like the on the helmet no no, no I'm like full helmeted yeah yeah, 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 perfect, yeah. 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 I think the default is the full helmet but yeah. yeah, like yeah. the X the X arc looks amazing. I think like it looks really really good. Like even that, even though it's both feet planted, like I, I, it still is a bit more dynamic. It still looks a bit more. It looks like he's challenging someone. It's, it's, just, it's one of those things though. Where I don't feel like they can win because it's like if you do that on all of them, then people start moaning about the tactical rock, and then like you, yeah, you know what I mean? yeah, like, you are right. You know, you and, are right. and I feel like also I personally, but even with combat units, I feel like. They can look a little bit goofy in like running poses with no context. Like, so just on a base on its own, out, not in a diorama or anything, having it just running can sometimes look a little bit goofy. I think it's such a fine line to walk. Across. Yeah, like, I think just a very, I think having a unit varied yeah. just really helps just. I don't know, it just makes each model within that unit look a bit more independent, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. I think, yeah. Old world stuff. We haven't got time to, to talk about this for 15 hours, but like the every time I see new models come out for this, I'm getting more and more and more excited. Like it's so uh, good. Yeah. Um let's start start with the start with the 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 the, the piece of the resistance. Start with the with the the, the yeah, oh my god. Like square bases are back. <laughs> yeah. They look good. They're back and they look good. They look good, i got to say. They never stop looking good. I know, like, I'm just saying. They, they don't, it does, you're not like looking at it and going, ooh, I'm all around bases. They look good to me. Yeah, I am so excited by this model. I think just as just purely for painting, um, I don't think, I, I, I don't 
think I'll have time, let alone the desire to paint a full, a full old world army. But as an individual piece, that model is absolutely jaw dropping. I know we spoke about like the retro stuff before, but I think it's quite clever with all of these, how like they look retro, but, but, but they're not. But they're not. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, well I think- some of them, some of the reveals are old models that they're bringing back. What, I'm like the Pegasus sure. Knights? Yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure they are just old models. Is it? Is that the only one? Well, I, or are the rest of them all completely new? I had to double take. When, yeah, so I, when I saw the, the this, uh, when I, obviously when I caught up. So I'm the, sure, they don't say either way, but I'm sure that's just old models. They, back that then. looks like to me the old, and again, correct me if I'm wrong. From the paintwork, I would guess it is the old it one. Looks like, it looks like old models, but, re, but new new paint job potentially, or is it old models, they've just redone the bases on the old models potentially? I don't no, know. I think they're the old ones, because if I zoom in, like the the quality is like noticeably different. I might be wrong, but I, I absolutely like think that the it's, other images. It's great. I mean, the new models look phenomenal, and I think, but that the the it's the silhouette of the model. You get used to a silhouette of a model, and for me, unless they've literally remade the old model but fully in plastic, that is the same silhouette as the old model. Well, I think I actually a lot of this is going to be resin anyway. Okay, so maybe they've re- made resin um, versions of the old metals. I don't know if they're one hundred percent clear on that. On in the article not sure they used um, to be but the peg- I know for a fact all the ones that we've been that have been revealed so far before this so we've got like the banner bearer yeah um, the the lady on the horse I think that was an old world thing they said that they're going to be resin so yeah it says a lot of it says here there's going to be, gonna well. be uh, the wording is as revealed previously there's also a selection of brand new resin characters so that implies to me that some of these are plastic but so yeah. the, uh, the old Pegasus Knights were a mix of plastic and metal so I'd imagine that if they're, 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 like they're going to be resin, maybe that yeah well it just it'd just be really interesting to see how they're doing the Bretonian range just because yeah they're all they're, they're, the Empire range as well uh, we've done a uh cheeky little audio exclusive as well uh, we recorded this week with uh, Adam Skinner one of the yeah. members of uh, members of the team here at Siege also a seasoned competition winner yeah how many how many GDs has he won I think it was nine or something nine gold beans casual yeah I think he said, he, what he said on the episode as well he won his second time going yeah yeah he went the first time didn't win went back the second time won and was like oh yeah okay I can do this yeah fair enough yeah um, um, so that's a little uh Basically, we had we had Adam come down, film an episode with us, mm-hmm. and uh, what we've done for this one as special is we're going to be releasing the audio only of this one uh, on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen, Google, all of those platforms. Uh, if you go to the link in the description of this video, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you can subscribe or follow us over there. And on Monday morning, that'll be uh, Monday the 23rd of October, uh, that'll be going live in the morning for you to listen to over there. Yeah, and you still get a normal one of these episodes next Friday as well. Yeah, a little bonus Not episode for you. Not that at all. Um, so if you want to leave a little review while you're over there, a little rating, that'd be nice. This is why I'm saying thanks. Thanks for the extra episode. Uh, should we do the viewers' comments? Let's do it. Yes. Chunky078 says, To your point of Ultramarine successes that look like other first founding chapters, when I take my scythes of the Emperor to a tournament, I get the comment a lot of, oh, Imperial Fist Ultramarines, just because they are yellow. Oh, true. Yeah, I guess yellow yellow and black, can't they? Yeah. So I guess they're kind of, that kind of, um, similar to what I was saying about Paul's... Uh, it's like we said about how... All the factors look, looking like, looking like Dark a Dark Angel's Angel successor. Um, I never, to be fair, I'd never looked at, at the size of the Emperor and gone... Oh, they must be imperial fists. Well, they're more black than yellow. So typically, they have more black on them typically than yellow. So it's... That kind of depends. It's like 50-50, I think. But. Um, uh, to be honest... I couldn't that, look at their scheme and go, that's an imperial fist. Because it just... it Personally, because it doesn't... It's not... I think it's that thing of what... I think what they're getting at is like people have these connotations of like, there's only so many like main colours, right? Yeah. And because you've got all of that in the first founding chapters, whatever you have is people just link so back to the originals but like anything you see that's red is like oh it's just a variant of a blood angel yeah yeah anything yeah. you see that's green is like oh it's a variant of a dark angel yeah, yeah potentially so yeah yeah uh comma 8203 says uh we do a lot of scale model stuff and we use a dehydrator to dry the paint fast never thought of that it's a good idea uh yeah it's a fun little uh, hobby hack i thought yeah that. yeah just save that to the end of the episode well we've got, uh, we've got a credit one, for but it. i should have done that i should have done that <laughs> Uh, I found that interesting actually because I was thinking like my initial off the bat response was like surely that will like mangle the model up like I, in my head it was like a heating thing but it's not obviously just dries them with air right it takes yeah. the moisture out of it yeah. I do yeah. it's crazy to me how different 
the world of like just regular scale modeling. There's no it's, overlap. It's wild. It's so weird. For two things that are so similar, there's so much difference between like the world of scale modeling and the world of like painting more. Do you find it funny as well that like we almost both pretend each other don't exist? <laughs> yeah. No one I know does both either. Like no one I know, it's like, oh yeah, I'll I'll jump onto. There'll that be the well. product know, that like, like bleeds into both. But generally actually, doesn't speaking, Adam, I, I think Adam might. Adam does. Adam might yeah, Adam does. And I, and also like. It's not specifically scale modeling, but air, but airfix kits kind of are. That's scale like, model. But, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but not, not but like when I say scale model, I'm talking where you go right to the nth degree and make it look real as a as a as a does that make sense? So it looks all properly weathered or I'm talking like just sticking the wings. Yeah, but wings air, airfix can be like that as well. Airfix it can is just be, yeah. like an accessible version of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Crazy. I think airfix is kind of like is the gateway into scale modeling, I suppose. I came from that yeah. when I was a kid. Yeah. 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 I used to do loads of model kits when I was younger, like model yeah. cars and that. Mm-hmm. Uh Zedric says, uh, this is this is in regards to the Blood Angel thing that we've done a few weeks ago, okay. uh, where we tasked James with painting an ultramarine and you painted the Blood Angel. Yeah. Uh, he says, James understood the assignment perfectly. Thank you. He Dan. just chose to ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> correct. Yeah, I uh, think that is, that is the correct answer. Again, I'll say it one more time. It's tactful painting. I saw someone on TikTok said, uh, said in the comments of that clip, they said the only way this could look more like a blood angel was if Sanguinius was stood next to him holding his hand. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's fair to be, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, uh, Stoogy says, I've put, uh, oh, this is in regards to the uh, the helmet chat we had about uh, Gullum and mm-hmm. the scale difference. Uh, Stoogy says, I've put Gulliman's helmet on one of my stern guard from the Leviathan box. Looks feckin' ace. Love the podcast, fellas. So someone has done it. Someone's done it. And it looks good. Send us pics. We yeah, like, I need to see it. We'd, yeah. like, we'd like to see photos of that. Yeah, Send, uh, yeah tag us on uh, on Instagram on that one. That looks, In uh, my head, I'm thinking of it, and I know what I'm thinking of it, is it, way worse than it, what it actually is, and it looks like a bobblehead in my head. I, I have to agree. Like the size of it is so. Like, well, I know that it won't be that bad realistically. But In I my head, I've like dramatized it, and I'm like, "This is yeah. going to be like Funko Pop from Marine." Like, yeah, well, yeah, I, yeah. I would have thought that given the size of the helmet. Yeah, maybe it's just not that big. Like. Oh wait, is he using the helmet or the bare head? No, it must no, be the helmet. helmet. He said the helmet. helmet. Yeah. Oh, I thought he, he did say the helmet. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, got a bit of a bit of a longer one here, but I'll read this off. Uh, Niall Richard Curran says, "If you see this before recording, or maybe for the next one, would love to ask your guys' opinion on grimdark color schemes. Is it overdone by now? Do you like it? Enjoy it? I see a lot of Siege Studios. Uh, I don't see a lot of Siege Studios doing grimdark style." Though I've seen you do minimal weathering from time to time. Personally, I think a little scuff, especially on boots or guns and vehicles in particular, is great. But some people are basically dipping their models in weathering grease and calling it grimdark uh, to cover up for crappy paint jobs. That being said, Traverion is a legend and his style is insane. So where is the balance for you? Thank you. First thing is that as a studio, the style is box art style. So that's probably why you see a lot of a lot of the stuff that we do in that way, because that is the style that we paint as a studio. Um, having said that, we have plenty of projects that have requests for weathering on them. Um, we would more than happily do something that's the Grimdark style. We've been sharing a sister's army uh, over the last few weeks that we yeah, doing, I was which say, is kind we've, of Grimdark. We've, got, we've done quite a few projects, actually, where specifically the client will request a more Grimdark style. Yeah, yeah. I just think... Because, as he said, there's a lot of people out there going because you because you can go so far with it and and call it grim. I think grim gets like, a bad rap because of that thing that, like you said, is like people have kind of used it as like an alternative for slap chop or like doing stuff really yeah, quick. Yeah, but it's like but the thing is, is it like. <laughs> there's no specific way of doing something badly. It's just the amount of time you want to invest into it. And and the thing is, is like that style. Yeah, you can essentially achieve it very quickly. That level of refinement. I mean, I you I've seen Blanchitsu style stuff or Grim Dark style stuff that the weathering is like so refined and it's so clean and it's so well executed, like on a technical perspective, that the amount of time investment for that is near on comparable to doing like a very high end piece, a very clean finish as well. So I don't think doing something in that style necessarily means. I think if something's done well, it's done well. It's kind of irrespective of. The style. I think of the it is. Job. It is just. I was going to say it is just a style like anything else, where you can get an awful version of it and you can get a really amazing version yeah. of it. But I think the difficulty comes with like everyone has a different interpretation of what, how, how 
weathered it has to be to be grim dark. You know what I mean? Like we've done plenty of jobs that have got weathering on them. Yeah, plenty yeah. of jobs that have got like um, been made, you know, a darker color palette by the request of the client or something like that. But this person or anyone else might look at them and not necessarily look at it and go, "Oh, that's a grim dark model," because it's still fully edge highlighted and it's still fully done in the box art style. So I just think it's like there's just so many different ways to do it. I don't know that grim dark like needs to be like heavily weathered and battered to fit that narrative either. But that's what I mean. But I think that's what people that that's like that's what people. Um, will look at and say, oh, it's grim dark. That's the signifier. But I think if but you, go, you can do it without that. It's dark colour palette. And- I think before, like, the hype around grim dark, like on YouTube, which is where a lot of it's come from, I think if you went back, like, just a few years and you showed someone, like, the new box art um, Sons of Horus Marines from uh, the Age of Darkness box, I think people would have called that, like, grim dark. I don't... But when, because you, now- when, you, when you look at, Bla- like, Blanche's old, not the second Ed one, but like the Epic cover, for example, that got on the wall, or if you look at any of the older stuff, it it's it's quite, when they say grim dark, it's still quite like dirty and detritus and like you've got like, yeah, you it know, does go I'm saying that can like, be done in a but clean way, but, but because think, it's been taken to the extreme now, I think when you say grim dark, you instantly think of something that's been absolutely tattered to shreds. Well, mm. as that's what I'm saying, like that, like that artwork, like it's all the, 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 the red, the yellows, the greens, they're all really saturated and high end, like bright colors. Um, but it's still, it's still got a cleanliness to it as well. So, like again, that's what I'm saying. It's that refinement of the of the of the of the weathering, the damage, the like the, the streaks, the damp, all those kind of things. That like, is the refinement of it. Um, there is also examples of where people are doing like the it's like caked in uh, dirt and everything, and they can get a good result out of it. Yeah, hundred like, percent. It can yeah. look good. It can look good. Of so, can, so. Yeah. It, it, it's yes yeah, so well, that's not I think everyone's shot. got different it, that's, it's that's the like, exact that, same that, like, conversation like, there's yeah. nothing wrong with it it's just yeah. the way you want to execute it and you can do it really well yeah I think we, we get asked for weathering every now and then but it's quite rare that we get asked for like specifically grim dark or something like that yeah, but yeah, it, does yeah. it does happen it does happen if you're enjoying this episode of Paint Perspective, I just wanted to ask that you do us a huge favour by leaving a rating and review on whatever platform you're using and also choosing to follow and subscribe. It'd really help us out and it helps us deliver these episodes to you for free every week. Now back to the show. So we've obviously painted a lot of projects uh, over the course of the 10 years of Siege been going, uh, both individually and as a collective. Obviously, all of us in the artist chat share tips and whatnot. Uh, can't speak for you, James, but I've easily painted well over a thousand models in a my short painting career. Uh, So these are going to be all of the hacks and tricks and tips and the things that we've learned over that experience uh, that we wanted to share with you and things that we think are the most important, both in terms of mindset, general application to a model and some specific little tricks for being efficient, uh, either as, you know, batch painting an army or maybe working on a character. We're going to have tips for both of those. Uh, So we've curated a bit of a list here and uh, we're going to go through I'm going to kind of proxy the listener in this chat. So I'm going to do my best, if you're listening to this or watching this, to, if you if you have a question that you want answering and then you're screaming at your TV, I'm going to try my best to pick up on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, first one, James, I'll let you shoot this one because this, uh, this is yours. Uh, paint in by order of majority colour. Yeah. So uh, like, I think for efficiency and for consistency, one of the things, especially when you're approaching a batch of models, let's say five or 10, um, one thing that I've noticed from a lot of classes and from feedback from talking to people who come in our classes and questions that we get asked about efficiency and how do we produce armies, you know, in such a consistent uh, fashion, you know, uh, even right down to the little nuances like grenades all being painted the same, buttons being painted the same, all those kind of things. A lot of painters like uh, paint in a method by, uh, by by butterflying a little bit when it comes to color choice. So obviously build and clean the model and do all the things you normally do to get to the painting stage. Um base coat the model with the main armor color or the main majority color and that the thing is so poster boys as an example ultramarines paint them blue yeah okay following that that or not as we experimented with last week <laughs> yeah or not yeah yeah or paint them red um uh but um the the once you have the majority color on it's at that point where what we sort of what we try and do and obviously what we do sort of train and all those kind of things is like working in a uh, majority color in descending order so what that means if we take like ultramarines as an example you know let's just let's, let's take using this white dwarf let's take this classic second ed color scheme so you've got you've got obviously the blue uh of the armor um 
that you then then pick the next majority color that the the models require. Do you so, mean in terms of like whatever there's most like surface area yeah. of? So a lot of painters will paint by the physical detail that's on the model, and what that breeds is a butterfly effect of looking at the detail, registering what color it is, picking the the color from your paint, putting it on the palette, applying the paint to that that region, then selecting the next bit of detail. The color will inevitably be different unless you are doing what I'm going to suggest you do. And then so on and so forth. And what happens is you're changing colors and wasting and hemorrhaging time, changing the color over and over and over and going back to previous colors because you've then seen a detail that needs the color that you put applied to the model two or three stages before. So one of the things to really, that, that this method actually eradicates is the hemorrhaging of time and being way more efficient with not only the application, but also the time you're investing into the models. So by picking the next majority color after the base color. So let's take again, these ultramarines. So if you're painting OG second edition, you're going to go, I'd say it's probably yellow because you've got the aquillas, you've got the trims, um, that I would, or if it's gold, obviously, if you're painting modern, uh, modern ultramarines, then you would get the gold and you would apply the gold, gold everywhere. If that is the greatest next majority color, um, that sometimes on well, most models that will verge between a, a select color or black black tends to always if you're doing my favorite mod, uh, chapter obviously it's always black because there's loads of black on the on, on the red but um always pick the next majority color and then once you complete it select the next majority color in a descending amount that it's needed so for example going back to these i would then say it'd probably be like the red for the gun cases the lenses etc cetera, etc cetera. so look, by descending color majority and as you pick up the next paint the next paint the next paint and you focus on the color as opposed to the physical detail what that does for you is it just means that you're only focusing on one action and one color through the set of models um, and it's something that we call a color set. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a descending color majority color set. So you work through the set of models in that color. And once you get to the end of the color set of those five models, 10 models, 30, 80, whatever it is you, you fancy tackling, like that color gets out your life and you don't have to worry about it again or pick it up again. The only time that you ever do is potentially at the end of a set, you do a quick check through the models and just touch any bits in or cut in any bits in that you need to. And then once you've done that quality check, you then remove that color and it goes to the side and then you pick the next majority color. And if you line your paints up when you're planning the project in descending color majority, so you've got your base coat on the models, you then go black, yellow, red, green, whatever, all the way down through the color majorities. What that means is you're, you're going to be efficiently working through that set and you can step away at any point knowing where you're up to, what colors you've got on the, or the ones that are to your left or to your right and the colors that you haven't put on the model yet that are in descending color majority on the opposing side of your palette, if that makes sense. So it really gives you a great way of being efficient, not only with time, but also the way that you layer the paint onto the models. You can like work it into your planning as well. Of course you can, yeah, 100%. Decide that, that order when you're planning your yeah, models. Like amen. Decide yeah, that order, Decide what order that's going to be before you even start painting the model. Yeah. I've got two things to, uh, to branch off of that, two sort of alternatives, but in the same ethos. You can take that a step further as well, and you can do uh, order of process by like, most important in terms of coverage, right? Mm -hmm. So once you've done all of that, what you've just said, but say for your base coating, mm -hmm. so you know doing your uh, doing your ultramarines, doing all the blue, then you're blocking in all the yellow, then you're blocking in all the red. I would do everything in process order. So instead of painting all the blue, a base coat of blue, and then shading all of the blue, and then highlighting all the blue, and then moving on to the next color, right, what okay. I would do is I would base coat all of the blue, base coat all of the yellow, base coat all of the red, base coat all of the black. Mm -hmm. Then I would shade. In the same order, so yeah, then correct. I shade all of the blue, yeah, yeah. shade all of the yellow, shade all of the red, and then go through it, and then do the same thing for the highlighting. And I would do that in individually, broken down, but per stage. Yeah, yeah. that gets a bit different when you get into like highlighting, because obviously you're going to be working with color mixes and sort of potentially if you're not that, using but, straight colors. And yeah, but but you're quite right. You can do that whole process, the color set system of across the models. Because you if you've got that. if you've got your washes out and like your brush, you like using for washes, you might as well like have your next wash like ready to go on because the other one's got to dry. Yeah. So rather than like. I'm going to shade all the blue armor and then get my hair dryer out and then dry it and then wait for it to dry and then clean it up. Do all of that in order. So you're slapping on your blue wash and then you're going to go on and start shading your red and start shading your yellow. Yeah. And then by the time you're done with that, it's already dried anyway. Correct. And if you're yeah. batch painting, you're going to be going in order of Marines down the list. So I feel like it is yeah important to just make the distinction because I think it gets lost sometimes from people that are listening. But in this case, for example, we're mostly talking about when you're batch painting stuff. Yeah. I know, for example... You're working on a single character, and we get into this a little bit actually on the bonus episode on Monday with with Adam. Um, in terms of he was saying, "Oh, 
there's different ways where he likes to maybe completely finish one area, but it might not even be, there might be loads more gold left on the model, for example, but he likes to completely finish this little section, stuff like that. So I think that still happens. It depends what your end goal is, but I think in terms of getting an army done and painting and everything like that, um, what you're saying probably helps. I think I've found that it helps my, I kind of do what you just explained. I do what George just explained up until the washes. I get all the shading done. Mm. And then it kind of just makes sense to me when it comes into highlighting, I'll then completely finish the blue off. Then I'll completely finish the gold off mm. and, yeah. and so on. Um, the, the, so, the, I was going to say, the thing is, it's like at first, if you've been painting, and I'm, I don't know how other words to explain it, but if you've been painting a bit like a butterfly from de and focusing on details and painting details, Flipping to this method of painting at first is a lot more arduous because, yes, you are inherently painting the same colour monotonously over and over and over and again across five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten models, whatever. But when you finish the last model, and because obviously your hand it has muscle memory and you remember shapes that you're painting, that repetition of that muscle memory and the shapes you're painting, the first one is always the, the takes the longest. The last one is always the quickest because of repetition being the mother. You're not even looking for where to put the paint on at that point. You already know, like, okay, back of the knee. Back of the knee on this side, shoulder, yeah, arm yeah. Bit. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I've just done it nine times. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it does. It does. The first one factually takes less time, and it will uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, because you've done the execution multiple times previously on the previous models. It mean it be the best. It should be the best best one that you do the quickest, if that makes sense. Cool. Glad we got that out of the way. I'm going to immediately contradict everything we've just said over the course of the last ten minutes. Cool. Uh, alternative <laughs> approach. <laughs> um, this is more in terms of models, and you know exactly what I mean when I say this. For example, say you've got a marine, like a Black Templar or something, and it's got like the massive tabards on it, like down the middle. Or another model that's got like just loads of extra detail and stuff in kind of awkward areas. Mm -hmm. I like to do inside out painting. So the first color that I will apply will be whatever is going to be the most difficult to get access to. Mm -hmm. So I'm mitigating any time that's I'm nice. going to waste cleaning up. Mm -hmm. Because for example, say with a Black Templar, like a Crusader, where they've got all the tabards, if I paint that first, when I go to do the black, I'm doing the cleanup stage at the same time as the base coat, effectively. Mm. Rather than doing all of the black armor and then painting all the black armor and then painting the tabards, and then if I make a mistake with the tabard, I've now got to go back to the black. There's no swapping around of colors at all. And by painting from the inside out, you generally speaking, when you're going to do your next stage, you're doing all of the cleanup within the same amount of time. So there's no, you're never really cleaning up the model. You're only ever doing a block of color at a time. Thing is, you can combine what you've said with also the way the way that we mentioned previously. You just all you do is you focus your attention to the center of the model first, and you yeah. paint that bit. You paint that bit. With yeah, there's that still loads of ways to make yeah. it efficient, like and incorporate yeah, yeah. the things like we said. And like yeah. I said as well, when you start doing things like okay, I'm going to do all the shading at the same time, highlight at the same time, so on. It's yeah. just another example of how there's no set correct way to approach it. It's, you, you have to have all these different kind of approaches in in like, in your arsenal to mm. uh, then decide at each given task, which one is more appropriate for this model or which one's more appropriate because I've got to get 60 of these done or whatever. So, yeah, it's quite good actually. Yeah. Um, also, in terms of efficiency, something I like to do is we always think about like batch painting, right? But what I like to do is batch building, especially yeah. if you're doing an army project. Yeah, I agree. Um, you can waste a lot of time building models. It's kind of something that I don't think you really think about too much because because it's almost seen as like prep. It's like a separate thing to the process. When you think about, oh, how long is this army going to take? I always kind of in my head skip the bit where I've got to put all the models together. Yeah. Whereas you'll be like, oh yeah, it'll take me like this amount of days to paint that army or, you know, weeks or months, or whatever. Sometimes you forget that if you're doing like a bunch of space marines and there's like a bunch of big kits and vehicles and stuff, that might take like six, eight hours just to build one kit. Yeah. So being as efficient as you can with the building, I mean, you guys have spoken before about how that you can go get on a really granular level with this and start talking about like breaking down what order you cut stuff off the sprue. Um, but I mean, in terms of like, if you've got, say 30 intercessors to build and they come in a box of 10 get all three boxes of 10 out and just do each instruction step from each page and yeah get you you can just have one instruction book in front of you get you three times the sprue and every single time you do a step just do it three times yeah and it's like you said about how once you get to the third time or fourth time fifth time it's quicker than the first it's much quicker than the first yeah of course it is yeah yeah i mean yeah 100 percent. but i i would just tack on to that like i think that if you're in building mindset and you're building and cleaning if you're doing a full army build the whole army I know it's a lot more arduous, but you can just get some storage boxes from TK Maxx. And what you can do is- Shout uh, out is, OG listeners. Is, is, uh, is, uh, is you can then have the army um, f 
fully made so that you haven't got to, you haven't got to go back and go, oh, no, I've got to go and build that now. I've got to go and build that. If it's all built and it's all ready to go and you've done all the magnetizing, you've done all the things that you want to do to it, it's like on that tick list of from buying the models to ha- playing your first game with them fully painted, it's that whole entire section ticked off. I haven't got to worry about any of that ever again now. It's done, you know. Um, whereas what tends to happen is you'll buy your army, you'll buy all the all the, all the, all the miniatures, they'll go on your, on your pile of grey shame or on your cupboard or shelf or wherever they go. Um, you'll build the first lot, paint the first lot, realise realize obviously now you've got to go back and do that whole entire process again on that next model. Whereas if all of them are built, you think, oh, well, okay, I've just got to, now I've just got to undercoat them all. So you undercoat them all. Now I've got to just prime them all. Now I've just prime them all. And the the return the return part of the process is always closer to the finish, finish point, if that makes sense. Whereas what a lot of people tend to do is they'll just buy the army, make one set of models from the army. They'll go through the whole entire process doing the action across those 10 models and then they'll have another 70 models that they've got to essentially start from scratch on again so working by the process in 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 the way of doing it just helps massively to just make that return point a lot closer to the finished destination of having a fully painted finished army that you want to play with um so yeah, yeah i mean it's similar to like it, the amount of for not as much extra work in terms of like you're actually saving time mm-hmm. because, because you're doing it all at once yeah so you're actually saving time and getting more done mm-hmm. yeah like it's quite like if you get to a point where if you're doing an army and actually by the time you're sat at the painting desk you've even say airbrushed you've already airbrushed the base color you could do that all on all of them if yeah all exactly the same. yeah and then yeah. by the time you've sat down at the the painting desk to start painting your army properly you've already got the base color the base color on like the primary color on every single model. Yeah, the like, like the thing is, is like the physical time that you're going to be doing that specific action isn't really going to be quicker uh, if you do it together or separate. But the, what is quicker is the setup time. Yeah, like if you're airbrushing, the setup of getting if you're doing a mix, if you if you if you've got a clogged airbrush, all these kind of things, like all those little bits that the, the packing away, the setting up, the, all those it's all those parts that you get rid of and just get that whole entire thing done and that's where you start saving a lot of the a lot of the uh, of, of the time jumping quickly back to the color uh, set system it's opening the pot putting the pot on the, the paint on the palette diluting it a little bit this is why you drop a bottle like, i knew you were gonna throw that in <laughs> but it, irrespective you've still got to select that color put it on the palette make sure if well, it's, we, we've you know, done it before we, we, um, we've talked about it when you did the blood angels um heresy army yeah and you just got that's the way that you did that, right? Yeah. You build it all. I mean, it built. was you, Anid, but you build it all and then... Um, undercoat it, based it all, undercoat it all. Primed it all and yeah. then sprayed it all. Sprayed it all. You had your big ketchup bottle of blood, of red. blood red. Yeah. So like, by the time you're actually, you've saved time because you're, you're not having to set up all that time and yeah. you're further along when you start. Like if, if, if me and Ed had like done that project as we had like four weeks to do it so if we if we had done that project basically taking a mod unit building it cleaning it i uh, uh, putting basic material on undercoating it prime uh, priming it main color blocking it if we'd have done that individually unit per unit that's in that box You'd still be painting i'd still be painting <laughs> it yeah like so it's just yeah it's it's it does save you a metric ton of time well speaking of saving time one of the like big mistakes that i made early on was i got my airbrush and like any new tool that you get, I wanted to use it for like everything. Mm-hmm. And because the airbrush is so useful, you can easily do that, right? Like you can yeah. kind of overuse it. Yep. And I didn't realize how much time I was wasting faffing around, like changing color parts, cleaning the airbrush out. And because I was like base coating every, I would want to like base coat every single model and like prime every single model with the airbrush. So say I'd have like 30 Marines to paint, I'd use the airbrush to prime every single one which takes ages. Mm. And then I'll be like cleaning the airbrush out and then, right, okay, I'm going to put my base coat color in. So he's doing like blood angels. I put all my red in there and then I'd airbrush every single one. And it would take ages. Yeah. And then at a certain point I realized like, hang on a minute, let's go back to basics here. You can just buy a can of red primer mm-hmm. and like, yes, it's more expensive and it kind of in part does defeat the point of like, well, you might want to use an airbrush for certain things. Yeah. The efficiency of just <laughs> putting 30 Marines on a box and just spraying them. I mean- it's unbeatable. Yeah, yes, yeah. It is, yeah. I, 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 I'll say this: like a lot of people swear by surface primer. I don't really personally rate it very highly. Surface primer is the airbrush. The airbrush one, yeah. Like I, I get you use an airbrush, so you use a surface primer to do it. But the thing is, it's like I found I found surface primer personally that it, it on on metal and on resin, it's it doesn't give the a strong enough 
foundation for prime for base coat to go on typically like resin obviously i mean that's something we've spoken about before obviously but even like even if it did have just as good of a result like just the time thing is enough for yeah, me no, to, you're right, to not want to consider like, it anymore uh, uh, there's like there's a reason why chaos black spray can is one of the longest standing products that Gaines workshop have had yeah it's a lot i think it's older than some of the elder models in the range yeah okay <laughs> like it's it's because it is such a good product and it does the one thing or two things it covers really well uh, and and it saves you a lot of time as well. So like, I, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Like it's it's a brilliant product that um, that doesn't a job that there's no other product in there in the market at all about spray cans in general. Like for that, if you if you need like if you're doing dark angels, they, they used to be I think it used to be Caliban Green spray yeah, can. If Avalon Sunset used to be a spray can, like but any of the twelve cans that GW have in circulation, like they they will save you, or even Color Forge, or, or like any of these other companies that make spray cans, like. It will save you so much time and get you again ticking off that part of the sheet from from start to completion a lot quicker. I mean, that being said, like I love my airbrush and I still use it a ton. Oh yeah, 100%. I just like it to stay in its lane a bit more now. Yeah, yeah, and use it for the things that the problem, a rattle can can't. The problem for me with a rattle can in terms of doing it with a color is the matching it and tidying up mistakes and stuff. But even if you was gonna. One, I guess that kind of depends on the color that you're doing. But even if you was going to do it, it's just a priming stage like that, and you were going to still airbrush your base color, yeah, so that you could touch yeah, it up, whatever. Yeah. You're That's still what you're still eliminating it. like fifty percent of the time. Oh right? yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So another thing that like I I really really sort of like have dabbled with quite a lot over the last couple of years. It's stuff that I've we've, we've, we've taught on classes and I things. Don't know why I dabbled made me laugh. Sorry. It's okay. It's fine. It wasn't, dabbled even, a bit. wasn't even when James I've is dabbled. Up. It's um, not even the Jameses. Of, yeah. It's just funny. I've dabbled. In um, it. I've dabbled in the old Warhammers. Yeah. So, so been around. You, like with regards to sort of like uh, the, the 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 sort of Zenithal highlighting and Zenithal sort of airbrush approach, which is something that we get asked about all the time, and something that people on a class always sort of like want to understand and things like that. Um, thing with, with, with Zenithal, and, and I just want to say this, there's nothing against it at all whatsoever or the way that it executes. Um, sketching white or a grey, white and a grey or a white and increasing intensities based on the volume and the low and the height or where light interacts with the model is, is a skill that you should develop and you should be able to be good at doing. The thing is, is that if you don't do it, if you're unhappy with what you've done, once you've sketched over the, the, the color filter layer over the top, sometimes it's quite hard to either get it looking correct because you can't really change that underneath kind of like layer that you've put on with the Zenithal. So one thing that we sort of like train and sort of like we go into detail is something called VCM, which stands for volumetric color modulation. Now, what that is, is essentially taking a triad of, of a branch of color. So a, a really dark, your dark blue, red, green, a mid-tone blue, red, green, or, or whatever color you use or armor color you're doing, and a very, very bright uh, light version of that inherent color branch. So red, blue, green, whatever, blah, blah. Um, with light hitting an object, your shadows, unless you're in a cave with a torch above your head or it's nighttime and there's a light above you, your shadows on the underneath and undersides aren't black. They're not, okay? As in like, that, that, that's unless you're in that situation where you're in a cave or it's nighttime and you've got a fire or light above you, that's the only time when that would be the case. In natural ambient lighting, all your shadows are, are inherently a slightly darker hue or darker shade of the inherent color of the object or what it is. So what VCM is, is it's you're, you're modulating the color based on the volume and where light is hitting it. That's essentially what it is. So what you do is you, you paint the whole model in the shadow color, which would be a dark blue if we're doing ultramarines, going back to the white dwarf. We then get a mid-tone and we'd approach it from a 40, in between a 45 and a 90 degree angle and then sketch that onto the volumes in a way so that it, it transitions nicely. And then obviously we do the same with the light color focusing on the volumes, obviously just modulating that color to blend nicely into the mid-tone, okay? The one thing that that process of doing it by dark, mid, and then light is it gives you a, a, a much more control over the colors that you're laying on the miniature. So if let's just say, for example, you uh, you put your dark color all over the model and then you start putting the mid-tone on and you put way too much mid-tone on, it's very easy to just jump straight back to your dark color and then reapply that and blur that into the shadows a bit more and make the blend between dark and mid better. Same with obviously going from your mid to your light. You put your light on, you put way too much light on and kill the mid-tone and kill the shadow. You can then go back in and sketch in quite nicely because you've got those three colors that you're working in that in that triad of colors and you're incrementally adding those colors, that color or that hue of the color to the model. That's why I always advocate, you can always go to Zenithal highlighting at the end of it if you want to, once you get a much 
more profound control of the airbrush, but the control that doing it stage by stage and hue by hue that VCM or volumetric color modulation does means that at each point during the process, you can you can control the amount that you're adding to the model and, to, and tweak it to fit the overall look of the, of the miniatures. Um, I often find with a lot of Zenithal models sometimes that people don't don't really sort of like make the darkest area the inherent color of the object and what happens is your shadows look black which essentially means that the whole entire army or model is at night time which i know sounds silly but that's that also tends to like desaturate them as well a little like bit, you'll yeah. find that the color isn't as punchy as you might think it would be when yeah. you've got that high of a contrast yeah it, it can happen that it can happen and, and that's the thing and you get that classic thing where you turn someone's model over and the underside is jet black and it and, it, and inadvertently it just looks like primer so it doesn't look necessarily that it's actually fully painted, if that makes sense. Um, now, look, if you want your shadows jet black and they're at night time, that's perfectly fine. Um, but if you're trying to emulate a light lighting on a miniature in natural ambient daylight and you've got like a bright grassy base on the model and it looks like it's light, it's daytime and yet all your shadows are black, they're kind of conflicting each other in the way that it that it looks, if that makes sense. So VCM allows you to then just, as I said, control the color you put on incrementally stage by stage of the shadow, the mid-tone and the highlight. And then if you do make mistakes, you can easily go back to the previous step and just cut in with confidence because you know those three colors work effectively together and they all will blur nicely together rather than sketching it on with a zenith and going, oh, I've put a filter layer on. I now need to add more mid-tone. You put the mid you get a dark red or dark blue, put that on and then you just cover everything and it doesn't look right, if that makes sense. So I'd, I'd definitely advocate that for someone starting out. Do VCM first. Once you get the control and confidence with an airbrush, then if you want to switch to switch to uh zenithal then 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 do that and then that's that's kind of what vcm is one thing i kind of wanted to bleed on top of that if you're doing uh, a scheme in a more traditional sense so you're not going to do the color modulation you're just going to do a more box art style whatever mm -hmm. the importance of primer color choice yeah because obviously the go-to is black which people have understandably questions about but Picking a color that's going to save you time, like down the road and going to cover better, is really, really important. I think people just do, I'm guilty of this as well. It's like you can just slip into your default of like, oh, I'm just going to do black or I'm just going to do, you know, McCrag blue spray or whatever. I think that playing around with like experimenting in what colors are going to cover better over certain, certain other colors and trying to save yourself as much time as possible. If you realize that, you know, a color that you really, really like to use and it's going to be a major majority color for your scheme. Like maybe you've been doing it over black this whole time, but you've never really thought about like, why am I doing it over black? Like, have I ever tried doing it over gray? How does that impact the color? Does it look better? Does it look exactly the same, but it takes me 30% less time? Yeah. Or does it take the same amount of time, but actually, you know, it looks better and the color's a lot vibrant. It kind of yeah. depends what you're going for. I, I don't think a black or white undercoat makes much difference anymore, to be fair. Like in some, in some situations, if you're going for a very saturated color, then obviously white is going to help boost that color massively. But because now... Unlike back in the day, and I'm going to shoot myself for, for knocking old paints, but they, Here we they, go. They, 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 back in the day, it was a lot harder to put like yellows over blacks and like whites over blacks and things like that. But like, even with the new, and I've done it on my, I've done it personally, like you, I undercoated a model black and then got the new white scar games workshop can that thing covers like tar. It literally just, it's, it gives it such a good coat and it's super vibrant. And I think a lot of the modern colors like your, Avalanche, that is, that is, Primer, though, I suppose. Well, yeah. If you got it, if you took it out of the can. Yeah, but even it, I would even say that, like, it's just like, going to be thicker, though. So yeah, it is. It is. But I, I'd say, like, things like, for example, like some of the Vallejo Air White, like that covers very, very well over black. Like cold white model color, you dilute mm. that down. It's got loads of pigment in it because it's a model color paint. That covers really well. I'm talking over like black. as well, like further down into your painting process of like just going in with your with your brush. Yeah. Like if you're going to be doing say Blood Angels and they've got loads of gold trim on them. It's like, well, it does the gold paint that you like to use cover better over black or white? Because I bet that the red covers pretty well over both. So if you've been priming your models white because you wanted like a really nice vibrant red, it's like, well, would your red actually be just as vibrant if you put it over black? Yes or no? And then would that save you time down the line when it goes to base coating your gold because your gold actually covers better over black? Yeah. It's like thinking further into the process rather than just majority colors. It's how does it affect the yeah, yeah. chain reaction down the line? Yeah. Because yeah. like I said, a lot of colors will cover basically the same over both. Yeah. Like you've kind of got this idea in your head of like, oh, this covers better over black. So like, yeah. have you tried it? Yeah. I, I think that's good. I think a good test is to do undercoat black, gray, and white, and then put your same color over the three, see what one looks looks best. Because the thing is, I think if you put enough of the colors, the beauty of an airbrush is you can put lots of layers on and develop and saturate the color very easily with like five, six, seven layers of paint without obscuring detail. And I guarantee you that will look as saturated as putting 
two layers over 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 a white white base coat or white undercoat potentially. Um, but yeah, that, that's a good test to do and just just paint three models in different starting colors and see how it affects the coloration of the of the of the paint. Within that, I guess that goes to something that we've said a lot on the podcast, which is the importance of planning your project yeah. as a whole. Um, that goes for incorporating all of these steps, like taking five minutes to sit down and come up with a list of roughly how you're going to do things. I and mean, we don't stick to it like, it's not like your Bible list that you've got to really yeah. nail down, but like having an idea of what order you're going to do things and how you're going to approach it. I say a hundred million thousand times, like the, 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 having a painting journal and planning a project, having a swatch paint bit at the back of the book where you chip, do swatches of all your paints so you can pick, pick colors and things like that. Like that is hugely, hugely helpful like for planning. Do you know what I've done? What? I've done this week. I forgot to mention it. I bought a painting journal. Well done. Yeah. Went to the range, spent a whole three pounds 50 on a, do you know Windsor and Newton do like proper like, yep. oh, but they're like super cheap. In my head, this was like an investment. It always made me laugh that you could get Windsor and Newton stuff really cheap in the range. Cause obviously the only exposure I'd ever had to Windsor and Newton art was, shops, fine art shops. was like series seven. Series seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously you can't get series sevens in the range, but You'd walk in, I walked into the range, I remember seeing Windsor and Newton in there for the first time and I was like, oh my God, and I was looking at it all and I was like, this is so cheap got, <laughs> compared to my only experience. I got this tiny little like, it's like A5 or A6, like a tiny little book, which yeah. is what I wanted. I don't want like some big no, no, journal no. thing, but um, for an upcoming project, which I will not spoil, uh, I wanted to practice mm -hmm. a bit of a, a bit more like 2D painting, yeah. I'll say, without uh, trying to ruin yeah, anything. Yeah. And uh, I realized that I had nothing to, nothing to practice on. I was like, I'm not going to get a bunch of printer paper and just yeah. go after that. But, but it's uh, also like a lot of paper, like people will just buy like a pad from like Sainsbury's or like or like WH Smith's or whatever. The paper has got a bit of a satiny kind of finish and your acrylic paint will bond to it. But then it will, once it dries, it will peel off. Mm -hmm. You need a, a proper acrylic, uh, acrylic uh, journal or painting so journal. So artist paper. Yeah, artist yeah, paper. So, yeah. that the, that, so that the paint does adhere to it and stay adhered to it. Um, it's going to desaturate a little bit, which is normal with paint as it dries anyway. Um, but it's going to stay on that page consistently for you as well, which is, is, is one of the advantages of spending a bit more and actually getting a proper painting, painting book or workbook. Yeah. I mean, one thing we've spoken as well, uh, on an episode, uh, a couple of weeks back was the, the importance of taking breaks, but I don't mean in the grand scheme of like, oh, you should take like a week off to let your mind rest. I mean, in terms of like, well, you should, you should, but if you going to be painting, say you spend like a weekend painting, it's very easy to lose track of time. And I'm very guilty of this, of like, I'll be painting for like four, five, six hours in a row and you'll neglect to eat or give your back a rest or stretch your legs or go outside and Just set yourself, <laughs> that sounds silly, but say, like, I, I've been there as well where like I had a model I really liked or a project that I really struggled to put down or whatever and you invest tens of hours into it or ages into it or whatever. Or even for on commission side, like you're doing a project and you've got to get X done by a certain time or a certain point whatever like that that setting a timer and going right okay i'm going to do a two-hour session and have a and then when that alarm goes off i'm going to have like a five ten minute break it's, they're really important um you know they're really really important and and if you if you forget about that and don't give yourself that the whole thing becomes a lot harder and a lot worse for you yeah one thing i wanted to say to like finish off this list just to round this topic out is the thing that i've realized probably is most important over the course of all of my painting has been the thing that really sets aside like a super well painted model from something that's you know okay or mediocre or trying to push yourself is i always used to think about it in this grand scheme of like massive techniques or like i'm going to do like the blending like this or i'm going to go for like this style like we said about like grim dark earlier or i'm going to go for like nmm what have you i think the real jumps happen in the very very small things and it's one of those processes, I think painting miniatures is one of those things where the more tiny things you do that are the corners that people generally tend to cut because mm -hmm. they don't seem noticeable, like they really make any sort of an impact. Mm -hmm. When you do 20 or 30 of those things on a model, they really add up. Of course and they do. There's something that like when you look at the model, it doesn't like jump out and glance at you and it's not like super apparent that you've done it. But when you compare it to another model, it's when you notice those things. Yeah. Little things like painting two or three catch lights on a gem to make it look more reflective or, you know, they've got this uh, leather pouch on them and there's actually a bunch of buttons on there. It's like, have you picked out and highlighted those buttons with metal? What color metal would they be? Yeah. Have you like highlighted the rivet? Is the rivet catching the light or is this one in shadow? Loads of little things or like you're going to do two or three stages of edge highlighting, but have you done like a tiny little dot in the corner? It's mm -hmm. just a little reflection. It's tiny little things, which 
take basically no time, but because they take no time and they don't really seem like that impactful, they tend to be glossed over. But, but that's when you're looking at it at a very granular level about the individual little minute thing that you're doing. It's when you then, again, look at it again overall as a whole, that all those things, like you said, do add up and they make the model what leagues better than than one that all those little in- incremental little things have been missed out on. Um, so, yeah. Should we do a question of the week? Yeah, question of the week. Harry Bells 2315 says... Any tips for getting metallic flakes out of your brush? I spam the water pot with non-flaky water like I'm trying to whip cream. Run the brush over a sponge and gently push the bristles onto a piece of kitchen roll with my fingernail. But there's always a tiny little bit left in there and sure enough, it pops out when I'm trying to paint someone's eyeballs. Maddening. Much obliged, gents. Yeah, metallic this flakes. This has got to be a James answer, I think. I feel like you've... Do you know what's immediately popped out of me is... I spam the water pot. That concerns me. I know this is like in jest, obviously, but brush care. Like, look after <laughs> yeah. your brushes, man. <laughs> yeah, just hitting yeah. the bottom yeah. of it with the with the bristles. Yeah. And just smashing it on the bottom of the water pot. That's the best way to get the flakes out, I would say. James, you've just uh... absolutely batter your brush. <laughs> James, you've well, been around a paintbrush. I've never, I've never known anybody to attempt whipping cream while trying to clean a brush. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but yeah, no. Um, first things first. Use a, I use three water pots when I paint. So I use one for normal acrylics, one for metallics, and then I've got a clean pot basically. So I will do all my metallics and rinse the brushes in the metallic pot, and then I'll use the the clean pot as like a second thing. I'll get as much off as I can with the first one. You're through mixing you inevitably gonna they're all gonna get dirty eventually but it just helps it just helps to it helps to basically just give an extra clean uh for the brushes but yeah brush care is really important and i'd say like a lot of people think that like brushes are just these things you can consistently keep using 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 without any kind of like tlc and they're just going to keep performing consistently over the duration of their life and that's not the case like i'd say if you hit the brushes hard for like a week or if you're painting every night like for a week in a typical average week if you're doing that like one evening should be i'm gonna clean my brushes for half an hour or for an hour or whatever because the the, what happens is specifically with metallics is again slightly biased obviously because i developed and built a a brush company and brush range but like the the hairs that are in the in, in in the brush head like metallic fire metallic pigment will sort of like dry midway through the the hair on a brush and what tends to happen is that that constriction of the plastic, which is what the paint is made there, essentially, it's a plastic. It it causes that hair to then snap because it creates a weak point and uh, on that on that hair. Um, so one little tip for getting out all the bits, there are two little things. First things first, I use a bit of uh, airbrush thinner uh, or cleaner. They both reduce down paint uh, in various different degrees. Um, but airbrush cleaner or thinner to to rinse all my brush heads when I first start doing a clean. And then I'll get the brush head between my index finger and my thumb and sometimes apply my nail if I need to and pull the brush back while applying pressure and then draw all those stuck on fibers or pig, bits of pigment off the brush hairs. And the thinner or cleaner will weaken down that, that dried paint on the brush. Um, same thing, hold the brush vertically and it sounds a bit grim, but use a bit of your thumbnail to go around the ferrule and just pull out any paint that you have put into the ferrule. It's because again, that will block up the ferrule, weaken the brush head and cause the brush display over time. Um, once you've done that, the cleaning with the airbrush thinner and cl- or cleaner, um, that kind of like sucks. It sounds really silly, but even though it's a liquid, the thinner or the cleaner, it does create a bit of a dryness in the brush head. So when you've done that, rinse it with water and then you would do a full clean of the brushes using uh, conditioner. You can use hair conditioner. It's, it, it, that conditions, obviously, the, if you're using Kalinskis in its proper animal hair, you can use hair products on your, I'm not saying go out and buy L'Oreal for all your brushes, but... but um, Soap as well. Yeah, soap as well works really well. Um, yeah, like you've got the various different manufacturers of, of miniature paintbrush soap, uh, and also you can just use general soap as well. That works. But you should go through a full process. The bottom line is don't expect your brushes to consistently perform and be at their optimum and their best for you for poor performance. If you're not looking after them as well, like they won't just consistently perform all the time. You need to put in some time to look after them and repoint them. And most importantly, when you, when you brushes are wet and you don't store them vertically because water will recede into the ferrule, it will mat the, the, the constricted hair in the brush head, which then causes your brush heads to splay, wet them, 
rinse them off, clean them, dry them, get them to a nice, pull them to a nice point, and then leave them horizontally flat on the table. That means that the water can't permeate or recede into the ferrule. It doesn't cause problems with brushes splaying, and the brush will stiffen and go hard as the as the water evaporates from the brush head. And all you do when you restart using the brush is you can either wet it straight away and it'll go uh, soft again, or you can just crack it with your fingers and thumbs, and it will just kind of like poof into like a into like a bit of a fan kind of shape, and it will just help your brushes last longer essentially one so, thing that i like to do as well is metallics are inevitably harder on your brushes than they are yeah. acrylics yeah and as are washes as well i have not like junky like acrylic brushes but i'll have brushes that are like dedicated to a certain task yeah just to try and keep as much life in my like really really fine brushes yeah, as yeah. possible yeah so i've got like nice Kalinsky brushes that i still look after and do everything that you said and, and they do last if you do that but I've got like a dedicated like metallics brush. Yeah. Because then one to like alleviate any cross contamination because you are going to be harder on them. But also one thing that I found is really important when you're working with acrylics, uh, when you're working with metallics specifically is rinse your brush way more often yeah, than yeah. if you was doing. Like, yeah. I don't mean wait until your brush is like starting to dry out or I'm going to clean it <laughs> off like you normally would. Like actively like, it's been about 20 seconds. I should probably rinse this now. Like regardless of how wet the brush still is or if it feels like it's still they going. Are, they are a lot more harsh on, on brushes, especially if you're using synthetics, then it's not so much of an issue because number one, the cost of a synthetics is less and and because of the nature of the fiber in the brush head, um, it, it will it will last a bit longer. It's it's actual physical real hair. So obviously Kalinsky's that it, it de- tends to have a bit of a negative relationship with. Um, so yeah, so I, I, yeah, washing it more. Using, using a dedicated brush and tanks is something that's actually quite good. That's a really good little tip. Normally um, to close out, we do a, we do a hobby hack, but I feel like we've won just <laughs> listed off a few loads, of the question of the then, week. And then the, the question of the week ended up being one as well. There yeah. You go. So if you want your hobby hack, remember to uh, stay tuned on Monday for <laughs> yeah. an episode with Adam. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening to Paid Perspective. Uh, please do leave your comments below if you want us to answer any of your questions for next week's episode. Like I said, please head over to uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, any of those platforms. Uh, on Monday to catch the episode with Adam. And we thank you very much. We will see you next week. 